Good morning, thank you for joining us for the third annual Critical Access Hospital Financial and Operational Virtual Conference. I am joined today by my colleague, Christy Bishop. And we will start going through a few housekeeping issues here. All of the participants will be muted automatically. If you'd like to ask a question, and we hope that you do, um, please either um, add a comment or use the chat, uh, the chat uh, and uh, Q and A feature. Um, all of our sessions are being recorded, and all of the slides and recordings will be made available to all registrants after the webinar. Um, there will be a short survey at the end of the conference session. And it's really important to us that you um, help us improve by um, filling out the survey. 
Um, we have a big day for you today, as you saw on the screen um, earlier. Um, the first presentation will be my colleague Christy Bishop and I, and we will be um, sharing with you findings from the field, um, improving opioid management and primary care. And then following our presentation will be our colleague um, Wade Gallen, and he will be presenting uh, cost report best practices. Following that will be our colleague Amy Graham, and she will be presenting pricing transparency, the cost of non-compliance and how to fix it. So we hope that um, the information presented to you today is um, helpful. And remember, if you do have any questions, um, we welcome those and um, please use the chat or the Q&A feature. Um, Stroudwater is represented here on this map. Um, we have uh, touched all of the states that you see and all of the hospitals you see there with all the dots, hospitals and clinics and so forth. Um, so we are very, very lucky to have the opportunity to serve so many uh, people in rural America. We also have a Stroudwater Capital Partners subsidiary that we are very happy to show um, the different areas in which they have made a difference um, in our rural communities. This is just a, uh, information around some of the um, services that we offer to, um, to our um, hospitals and clinics and community hospitals. So Christy and I will start with you today on um, findings uh, from the field. This is about the um, uh, improving chronic opioid management in primary care. So we'll first take a brief look at the US opioid epidemic. Um, talk a little bit about what our work within a program called the six building blocks and then give you some information that we have gleaned through our work in um, the primary care clinics in this program. Have some time for Q&A at the end. So as we continue to hear and look um, at data around our um, opioid crisis, um, we see that we still have um, ongoing uh, deaths from um, overdoses um, in the United States. And we just um, were able to pull information um, that is no longer considered just um, a, an estimate, but that uh, in 2022, we had a record high of nearly 110,000 um, Americans dying um, due to um, drug overdose. So who is at risk for drug overdose? Um, the CDC reports that 20% of the adults in the United States had indicated they experienced daily pain um, when responding to a health survey. Um, in JAMA um, in 2017, they found that 6% of opioid naive adult patients in the United States continued to use opioids 90 days after minor or major surgical procedures. And that makes chronic opioid use uh, a very common um, post-surgical complication. The CDC also reported that as many as one in four patients receiving long-term opioid therapy in primary care struggles with opioid addiction. The opioid, opioid dispensing rate in 2020 was 43.3 prescriptions per 100 persons. Um, we see a great uh, difference across the United States with a low of 27.3 in Hawaii to a high of 80.4 in Alabama. Um, prescription opioids were involved in nearly 18% of all of our opioid overdose deaths in 2020. And, but now that was down um, from 32% reported in CDC from 2018. We have seen a little bit of a difference in some of our um, opioid prescribing rates, um, but again, the prescription opioids are um, key to some of our overdose deaths. This is information about the predicted um, 2022 dispensing rates by state. 
just to give you an idea of where you are and how that um, looks in your particular state. Interestingly, primary care providers account for nearly half of all dispensed opioid prescriptions, which was a very uh, huge surprise to me when we first started this work. Um, I would have thought that the um, opioid prescriptions um, would have been, you know, most seen more prevalently in um, surgical situations um, and then in EDs, which in the past we did see a great deal of. Um, evidence does show, though, that long-term opioid therapy is not really effective for chronic pain, which um, begs the question of why do we continue to still see a lot of um, long-term opioid therapy in our primary care clinics. So there are management that, uh, benefits um, for those that are on long-term opioid therapy. Um, we need to the, uh, improve patient safety and quality of care. So there is a lower percentage of patients on high dose opioids um, and fewer patients maintained on long term opioid therapies by having a program in which you're managing those, pa those specific patients. Um, there is a reduced risk of opioid um, overdose. Um, there's also a reduced hospitalization, readmission, and ED utilization rate. Um, if you are really focused on proactively managing the high-risk patient population, then you know, we can definitely reduce those readmissions and ED utilization rates. Um, the CMS 2018 Medicare chronic condition data did show that 50% of Medicare members with drug abuse or substance abuse diagnosis had five plus other chronic conditions, which can also be um, you know, a huge um, a mixture there uh, that can contribute to an overdose. Um, there is uh, low prevalence, um, but high ED utilization and inpatient readmission rates for uh, drug abuse and substance abuse diagnosis compared to some other chronic conditions. And we include some of that information for you in the appendices of these slides so that you can see the different uh, chronic conditions um, that are, um, that are um, contributing to the, the chronic um, overdoses. Um, we do have increased revenue opportunities. So our primary care providers can care for patients that have drug abuse, substance abuse diagnoses, that may have opportunities to bill for our chronic care management and complex care management services. A little bit about the six building blocks. So the six building blocks was a program that um, was developed. It's an evidence-based quality improvement roadmap, basically, for, to help primary care providers and clinics implement consistent patient-centered evidence-based care for chronic, patient, chronic pain patients on long-term opioid therapy. Prior to this, there had never been something that was consistent for a um, primary care practice or clinic. This was developed by the University of Washington Department of Family Medicine and Kaiser Permanente Washington Health Research Institute with federal and state funding support. Their results showed quantitative improvements in patient care and safety and qualitative improvements in the patient provider and staff experience. And we have definitely experienced that in our work. The adoption of the six building blocks has been shown with included in the implementation package for the 2016 CDC guidelines. And now we have 2022 CDC guidelines. And it was also included in the Institute of Healthcare Improvement um, in 2019 with the uh, uh, resources toolkit. The, um, the original project and pilot was a team-based opioid management in primary care trial. Um, the research project um, was uh, consisted of 20 rural and rural servicing clinics in Eastern Washington State and Central Idaho. 
the um, support um, was there for 15 months for these clinics to implement the six building blocks program. They created an opioid quality improvement team at every site. Um, they also had team building uh, with a kickoff event, a clinic-wide self-assessment of these six building blocks. And that self-assessment really sets the stage for whether or not we have the, um, you know, what the thoughts are as far as our practices. What is that, if that self-assessment in a practice can show you what you really think is happening, and we know sometimes that's not exactly um, what is happening. These clinics also had facilitation by an external practice coach, and they also included monthly sharing learning calls, and then monthly uh, University of Washington telepain participation. After the, um, the trial, what was seen was really just dramatic. There, the total number of patients on chronic opioid therapy decreased greatly over the 15 month period, as well as the percent of morphine milliequivalent dosages. And that's a really important piece of this as well. We want to make sure that the um, that if as patients do stay on long term opioid therapy, that we try to address the dosing and decrease that morphine milli equivalent dose. Some of the feedback that was seen from these clinics that participated in this pilot, and we have seen the same thing in our work with clinics, is everybody that works in this clinic says to me, do you remember how much turmoil it was around it? Wow, we don't have any of that anymore. And we've seen that as well. The inconsistencies in practice have led some of these practices where uh, to have staff that are very frustrated, where they have some providers that would practice in one way and other providers that, that practice in another way. And then it really confuses patients because let's face it, sometimes your provider is not available and you have to see another provider in your clinic. And in that situation, it can be very confusing for patients as well to not have standardized practices. Another comment was the teamwork. There's been a lot of teamwork regarding it. I wouldn't say that was a surprise, but it's been nice. Again, another comment, hopefully there's no going back. It works and I don't think any of one of us wants to go back. And then from a provider, I saw one of the high milli equivalent dosage patients that I inherited. And again, that happens quite frequently. We just got him down to 80, just for him to say, you know, I'm much more functional. My pain is not different, might be better. So addressing the different, these different um, opportunities within the clinics through this particular pilot did make a huge difference. I'll turn this over to Christy and she can share with you some of the findings from the field. Thanks, Carla. Uh, slide, please. Uh, Strawwater's findings from the field to date. Um, Strawwater had worked with four hospitals and or systems within three states implementing the um, six building blocks program. The findings from the field data includes six team clinics, um, which were comprised of 61 surveys. The, the six building block uh, project includes um, presentations to orientate the administration, clinic staff, and six building blocks program, um, included data collection, implementation of opioid improvement team with the provider and clinic champions, the clinic self-assessment completed by the clinic staff to um, identify current gaps in their op opioid management, interviews with prescribing physicians and providers, the clinic support staff and administration, in-depth surveys completed by the clinic staff to better understand the current um, chronic pain management and opioid management practices and procedures within the, and across these clinics um, at the individual provider and um, physician level. About the, the steps that I had mentioned 
um, identified significant variations or gaps in our in their clinics, and sometimes we know, or in times we've even noticed variations um, within the clinics themselves. And, um, and the quality improvement opportunities allows us to offer recommendations for each clinic and implement and improve opioid management and patient outcomes. Slide, please. Uh, finding the highlights from the findings is the, the use of the provider resources using prescribing opioids, frequency and reasoning for patients, or excuse me, for seeing um, chronic patients and opioid therapy, use, use of the um, controlled substance agreement or any other agreement, circulation of patients' total daily um, dose of opioids, patients' communication regarding the pain management and opioid therapy, uh, patient screenings and assessments, and the use of the registry. Slide, please. Um, so the, the survey came back. Um, the use of the provider was um, when prescribing opioids. Does The question was, does the provider or physician use the 2016 CDC guideline for prescribing opioids for chronic pain and or the 2022 updated CDC guideline to manage the care or chronic pain um, patients on long-term therapy. So the blue is always, the orange color there is sometimes, and the gray there is um, NA, which means they didn't have enough to formulate um, some, some findings. Um, slide, please. Which is concerning if we don't know if, if they're using you know, um, a guideline. Um, frequency and reason for seeking a chronic pain patients and opioid therapy. How often does the physician provider see the chronic pain patients on long-term therapy? Check all that apply. So you can see their blue is monthly, which is at 45%. Um, orange is every three months. Six is every six. Yellow is annually, and when requested by patient is the lighter blue, and then green is, is NA. Um, and you can see there's variation on what, how we're checking their um, opioid therapy from monthly to annually, and sometimes we may not be doing it at all. So there's quite a variation there. Um, does the patient, or excuse me, does the patient, does this physician or provider require that their chronic pain patients come for an appointment or have a virtual appointment before refilling, refilling their opioid prescription. And again, the blue is always, orange is sometimes, and the gray is um, NA. So 48% of those patients are required to come in for a follow-up appointment before refill, refilling their medications. And then um, sometimes they are at the 19%. Slide, please. The use of controlled substance agreement or any other agreement. Does the provider physician use a controlled substance agreement or document or other patient agreement form for the chronic patients on long-term therapy? 61% said always, 3% said sometimes, and then the 36% um, was NA. So there's quite a gap there on um, whether or not we're using a great, um, an agreement on those patients. Slide, please. Um, circulation of patients, totally, total daily dose of opioids. Does a physician or provider calculate the patient's total daily dose of opioids guide for opioid prescribing decisions? So 34% said always, 1% said sometimes, and then 64% was unknown. Uh, does the provider or, or physician routinely discuss established treatment goals with their chronic pain patients before starting a opioid chronic pain therapy? 48% uh, said always, 1% said sometimes, and there's just a sliver there that said never, and then the 49% or yeah, 49% um, is unknown. Slide, please. Um, patient communicating re regarding pain management and opioid therapy. Does this physician provider routinely discuss known 
risks and re realistic benefits of the opioid therapy with the chronic patients who are on or considering opioid therapy. 75% said always, that 3% said sometimes, and then 22% said was NA. And I find this to be very important for our patients um, when they're considering opioid ther therapy. Um, we should be discussing them, the long-term effects and how to use that appropriately. Slide, please. Uh, patient screenings and assessments, does these providers or physicians conduct a random pill count with their opioid therapy patients? 25% of those physicians or providers said yes, 15% said no, and 60% was NA. So it's unknown whether the, they're providing a pill count um, with their patients. And I find this to be very important. As we all know, it's very highly addictive. Um, and counting those randomly sometimes is very helpful to see where our patients are standing. Um, how often does the physician or provider order a random urine drug screen to monitor their chronic patients and opioid therapy? 24% uh, said at the start of opioid therapy, 22% said annually, and 12 said every three months, and then 1% um, every six. And then the 40% is unknown whether or not they were doing a random drug screen. Slide, please. The use of the registry. Does the physician or provider maintain a list of the registry of all chronic pain patients on long-term opioid therapy? 25% um, said yes, 39% said no, and 36% was NA. Um, the registry is very important to see um, and for use of our providers and it's highly encouraged to use. Slide, please. We've left some time for some Q&A. Um, if you go right ahead and use our chat, we would be happy to take some of those questions for you. Thanks, Christy. Yes, please. Um, I'm going to go into the chat and the Q&A and I'll start there. So please feel free to um, add any questions. So we had a um, uh, one of the questions about um, opioid overdose and that um, that it's a huge problem, but 18% are associated with prescription opioids. And then how can we address the 82%? Well, I'm hopeful that we are all, um, I mean, there is not one great answer for, um, for the opioid um, uh, crisis and, and for some of the overdoses that are not even, um, it's not their prescri the prescription drugs, it's the synthetics. Um, that are, um, you know, that we're finding that are causing a lot of problems. But I want to go to the, back to the, the real premise of the primary care practices. With primary care practices, um, uh, you know, managing the real, um, the, hopefully the holistic patient, looking at what we can do to help manage this, this um, patient population, hopefully decreasing their dosages, offering other different type of alternative treatments for pain management um, may, and, and we know this has happened, may help to keep our um, primary care patients from seeking illegal substances elsewhere and other substances that we now see creeping into the market. So yes, it's um, prescription opioids um, may have some of a, may have a lower rate than some of the um, the other street drugs, but um, the problem is that we if we don't manage these patients, if they you know are not receiving what they think um, they should receive in the primary care practice, then they may um, look for other alternatives that are um, unhealthy. Um, we um, had talked about, um, we did have a question about the registry and we, we had mentioned that. So many of the um, 
many of the clinics are uh, keeping a, a list or registry of sorts for their chronic pain patients so that they can make sure that they do come in for their regular checks, for their pill counts, for their urine drug screens, um, to, you know, to make sure that they don't forget the important things that they need to do and, and checking in with the patients. Is it really helping? Um, have we tried some other alternatives um, to, to those, um, you know, to those uh, different, to the opioids or have, while we're decreasing the, decreasing the rates? Um, it, you know, even though, um, then back to the question about it being prescription opioids being a low dose, um, at a low um, rate of, of the overdoses, it, you know, one overdose is too many. Um, and unfortunately, many of us, I don't know too many people who haven't been touched by the opioid addiction, um, who has a family member or who has friends or family, you know, um, that have been touched by that. And a large majority start in primary care. So we need to really manage those in primary care so that we don't have um, that happen. Um, let's see, other questions, uh, comments? Um, Christy, do you see any more comments? I think I've found the... I don't see any comments here. Okay. All right. Well, um, at this point, if there are no more comments, please, our information is um, included in the back of our slides. Um, I do want to um, share with you, there are appendices. So appendix um, A has the different, includes the different elements of these six building blocks. And that's just for your information. Um, we didn't have time in this session to go through all of these, but it's there for you if you, you know, for your reference information. Um, information about how to form the opioid improvement team is there as well, um, along with the um, standard um, uh, self-assessment, clinic self-assessment for the six building blocks. Appendix B includes additional opioid use data that can speak to um, a lot of the information um, that we have used over the course of now a few years in this work um, to really understand the um, foundation of abuse, drug abuse and substance abuse and uh, death. Um, Appendix C goes into the chronic conditions data. So some of the prevalence around um, chronic conditions, and then how um, what we see with um, ED visits with the chronic um, drug abuse and substance abuse as well. Um, just our sources. And then uh, Christy and I have included our information. So thank you for attending this session. And I will now introduce you to um, my colleague that should be joining here and um, it would be Wade Gallant, and he will be uh, sharing cost report best practices. We'll just have a quick break right now um, while, while um, we give Wade just a minute to join. Thank you very much, everyone, for um, being with us today. Uh, please continue to use the chat or Q&A function if you'd like to communicate with us. And um, also, just another reminder that we are so grateful for your feedback. Um, so at the end of um, the session today, some um, a um, survey will pop up. So if you take a few minutes to complete that, we very much appreciate your time and your efforts in helping us improve. And thank you for being with us today.
So our next presenter will be Wade Gallen, and Wade will be presenting cost report best practices. Um, so Wade, we are ready for you whenever you are. Perfect. Good, good morning, everybody. Um, it's good to be here for the conference. Let me share my screen to get going. Bear with me for one minute. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the session on cost report best practices. Uh, my name is Wade Gallen, and I'm a senior consultant here at Stroudwater. My background is primarily in accounting, reimbursement, and finance, and so I'm excited to chat with I'll chat with you all about cost reporting. Um, I actually started my career in, in healthcare at a local Medicare administrative contractor, so with a lot of um, experience on the other side, kind of the MAC experience, if you will. Um, and so I'm looking forward to talking about the cost report in the context of my experience there, as well as helping hospitals with preparing cost reports. Um, so with that, we will jump in here. To go over what we're gonna be covering today, we're gonna talk uh, at a very high level about critical access hospital reimbursement. Uh, this is one of the most important things to remember for cost report preparation for a critical access hospital. Um, and so we're gonna high level touch on that. Then we're gonna jump into some of the best practices. Now I can't stress enough that the best practices we are going to uh, look at are not all encompassing. It's not a panacea. There are lots of other best practices, but you know, in thinking about cost report preparation and, and what some of the biggest opportunities are for our critical access hospitals, tried to narrow it down to four of the the most important encompassing areas that would be considered best, best practice for our cost report preparers. And then after that, we're gonna jump into some of the common reimbursement opportunities that we see here at Stroudwater. Um, Stroudwater has a, Stroudwater has a, the privilege of working with many critical access hospitals around the country to review cost reports. And when we do this, we find a number of, of opportunities that continue to spring up time and time again. So we're gonna jump into some of those um, common, common opportunities as well. And then we're also gonna leave some time for questions. If there are any questions throughout the presentation, obviously you can feel free to uh, jump in at any point, but we'll also have some time at the end for discussions for any questions to be asked as well. So to jump into the cost-based reimbursement overview, so this is this is really what makes the cost report such an important piece for critical access hospitals. So critical access hospitals receive cost-based reimbursement for the services that they provide from our Medicare payers, and in some states that includes Medicaid. So the services that we provide to those patients are reimbursed on a cost basis. And so what, what is cost-based reimbursement? Well, I think it's easiest to describe, you know, what it, what it does or what it offers to a hospital and what it doesn't. So what cost-based reimbursement does provide for a hospital is it provides a little bit of um, insulation. So because uh, cost-based reimbursement is based on your, what would be termed allowable cost, when you have significant volume fluctuations, let's say in your, um, in your total, uh, total volumes, but your cost structure remains relatively consistent. What happens is your rate that you're paid by Medicare, this cost-based rate kind of changes to be in line with those volume fluctuations. So you have a little bit of an insulation there to, to help with those significant volume fluctuations. There are some advantages in terms of uh, you know capital projects where you have depreciation expense. So if you have a new capital project, um, you are able to oftentimes claim that depreciation expense as an allowable cost 
and where that's a non-cash expense, it can actually help critical access hospitals with cash flow. And then it, it just helps hospitals to operate in communities where there are inherently low populations and therefore generally low volumes, again, because you get paid that higher cost base rate in a low volume situation, assuming your cost remains consistent. Um, Cost-based reimbursement does not protect a hospital from all financial woes, um, and it doesn't negate the need for prudent cost management strategies, but it does help um, some of our hospitals, especially in rural areas, to be able to operate in those low-volume situations. And this sets the stage for really the Medicare cost report and why it's so crucial. Um, so the, the Medicare cost report is a required document that needs to be filed every year with our critical access hospitals. And it's generally five months after your fiscal year ends, although you, there's a chance for short period cost report filings. And in that case, there, there's some time there. But when you file the cost reports, uh, if the MAC approves your cost report, which can be a battle in and of itself, but if they do approve your cost report, then that is used to set your rates going forward until a new cost report is filed. And so when we think about the importance, so your cost-based reimbursement, the amount that you're getting paid based on, on this methodology is really in many ways determined by your Medicare cost report and how accurately you file it. And so when we think about the importance, it's, it's incredibly important um, as it dictates not only our, our traditional Medicare, you are able to um, file your cost reports with our Medicare Advantage payers that they, they pay at the Medicare rates and then Again, for Medicaid, in some states, you'll get that cost-based reimbursement as well. So it's really crucial that when we're putting together our cost reports that we remember the implications here and kind of understand the why. Why is, why is cost report best practices even an important topic to discuss for our critical access hospitals? And because it, it sets that stage for cost-based reimbursement. So jumping into our best practices here, Again, this is not an all-encompassing list. There are many best practices that um, we feel that critical access hospitals should adopt when they're preparing and reviewing their cost reports, but these are some of the biggest um, best practices and most all-encompassing that you know, I, could, I could touch on during this brief period of time. And just to start off, um, so expense and revenue mappings. So when you prepare your Medicare cost report, there's the concept of matching or the matching principle that needs to be applied in your cost report. And this means that you need to have expenses, revenues need to be properly matched. And that will ensure that reimbursement is calculated accurately. So why, why is this important? Well, there's a potential issue where if we aren't properly matching our expenses, revenues, then our overall allowable cost, there's a higher probability that it's going to be misstated. And so there, it's really important, again, as we think about our Medicare cost report, setting the stage for our rates going forward, um, really adopting this principle and making sure that we're accurately mapping our expenses and revenues is crucial. Um, the hospitals will generally, or at least in my experience, generally map based on other documents such as the trial balance. Sometimes there's a revenue detail file that breaks down revenue by a revenue code or charge code or both. Um, and those are used in mapping for your worksheet C, your gross charges, for instance. And then the Medicare PSNR is often what hospitals will use to input their Medicare charges, both inpatient and outpatient. So the best practice here is really taking a good look at your mappings. So again, at, our critical access hospitals have to file at least one cost report a year at the end of their fiscal year. And it's really important to review our mappings annually um, to make sure that we're properly matching expenses and revenues. And one of the things that I've, I've personally heard, and, and even when I was preparing cost reports, there would be kind of this idea that, you know, mappings can sometimes be rolled forward. We, you know, we kind of look at them and we base things on last year. Um, and while that might be an appropriate way to do it in most circumstances, it's really important that as we're preparing our cost reports and as we're mapping out our expenses that we're reviewing, you know, are there any new departments this year that we need to um, give special consideration to? Are there 
new sub accounts that are generated in our trial balances and, and for you know, our smaller critical access hospitals, this might be a slightly easier task given, you know, we're not dealing with a significant um, number of accounts, so, such as, you know, the larger academic medical centers maybe in the cities, but even still, because our critical access hospitals get cost-based reimbursement, it's essential to make sure we review these at least annually. And I, I would even recommend doing this more than annually, you know, running running your trial balance, you know, the middle of the year to make sure that we understand, you know, what, what's going on here? Why do we have these new accounts? What do they represent? Where do we need to, to put these on the cost report? And so this is a this is a huge one. This is a really big area um, that we see opportunity for critical access hospitals and a really uh, important best practice to adopt as a critical access hospital. Overhead cost allocations. So when we're preparing our cost report um, on our, our worksheet B-1, B part one, for those who are familiar, we allocate our overhead cost centers on the Medicare cost report to other departments of the hospital. So our inpatient, our outpatient, our ancillary and other cost centers. And that includes our non-reimbursable or what the cost report refers to as non-reimbursable cost centers, which are kind of the, the ones we wanna avoid as much as possible. So when we are allocating overhead expenses, there's a potential issue where the method that we're using to allocate these overhead um, expenses is not really indicative of the resources that those overhead um, allocations utilize. So what do we what do we mean by that? Um, we have, for instance, our, our medical records department, and we're allocating to to other departments in the hospital based on gross charges. We generally find that that's not an accurate reflection of the time spent by those medical record individuals in each of the departments. So we have a mismatch there. This is pretty common, and you find them in many of the different overhead cost centers. So again, Medicare has prescribed certain methodologies. So if you look at your cost report, right, and you go to your worksheet B-1, you'll see many different prescribed methodologies that have been outlined by CMS. But it's, it's interesting when talking with different hospitals, sometimes it can be easy to get the impression that we just treat those as that's the way it is and, and there's no, no flexibility to change those when in reality, there is a process for seeking approval from our Medicare administrative contractor. These are the folks who are reviewing the cost reports, who are settling up the cost reports at the end of each year. There is opportunity to work with the, the folks over there at the MAC to consider alternative cost methodology um, options. And so this is something that you'd have to work with your Medicare administrative contractor to do, but you know, at the end of the day, again, when we are allocating our overhead costs, we want to make sure that they are accurately reflecting the use of that overhead department by cost center. Um, so this is certainly an opportunity. Our, our best practice, again, it's really reviewing these on at least an annual basis. And again, if you're filing interim cost reports, you should be reviewing these during each, each filing. Um, and really working to determine, are there better cost allocation methodologies that we could be utilizing? And if so, you can work with your local Medicare administrative contractor, maybe your cost report preparer um, to, to see if you can get approval for that methodology. But again, it's, it's one of those things where if you don't try, if you don't try working with your MAC, then it won't happen. Um, so I would definitely recommend reviewing that at least annually. Tracking our settlement. So traditional Medicare will settle up on the Medicare cost report each year. So what does this mean? This means that um, you are paid a certain rate throughout the year based on a prior filed cost report. And at the end of the fiscal year, the MAC will look at what your actual cost was, what your rates more or less should have been when you look at your total allowable cost, and then they're gonna issue you a settlement. They're gonna write you a check, or in some cases, the hospital will have to write the Medicare program a check um, based on what happened throughout the year. So 
this is one of those areas where, um, and this is gonna come up later on in our opportunities as well, but it's really important that we track that. Our, our Medicare Advantage payers, for instance, they pay based on Medicare rates, but they do not settle up at the end of each year. And so when we are going throughout the year, um, we just need to be mindful of that. Uh, it's also important for us to really understand what is our settlement or what is within reason, you know, what can we expect our settlement to be at the year end? This is just prudent financial management, being able to estimate those amounts owed um, or due to our third party payers, including Medicare. So tracking throughout the year is really important. We don't wanna be at year's end and realizing that we have to write, you know, a $300,000 check to Medicare, nor is it, is it great to find out that we were owed a significant amount of money because this means that um, we might have missed out on additional reimbursement from some of our MA payers. Um, and so we, this is a really important thing to do throughout the year for critical access hospitals, especially because cost-based reimbursement is a bit of a moving target, right? So when we are um, looking at it, there are cost fluctuations. Obviously our critical access hospitals have experienced significant cost inflation over the past few years. That This will change you know, fundamentally our cost structure and therefore we can be expecting changes to our, our rates from Medicare, from a Medicare perspective. Um, so what is the best practice? It says monitor cost report settlement throughout the year. So what we would generally recommend, there are, there are plenty of models out there that you can use. You can develop one, uh, a homegrown model that will help you get a sense for your Medicare settlement throughout the year. There are many, um, many, many practices that offer a cost report modeling software of some kind or a model that you can, you can purchase. Um, so there's really a lot of options there. And then the important thing is to develop internally a set of you know, thresholds where we say, okay, if our settlement is growing to a point, or at least our estimated settlement is growing to a certain point, we wanna make sure that we file with our Medicare administrative contractor, or at least try to. So that way we can realize um, enhanced reimbursements for our cost-based payers that might not settle up at the end of, at the, end of the year. So I'm seeing a question come through. So it says, is the Medicare administrative contractor for cost reporting settlement the same one that processes claims throughout the year? Um, and so, yes, yes, correct. Uh, so the Medicare administrative contractors, they have, um, and this is from my experience, so I can't speak to every single one, but in, in my experience, they have different departments that handle different functions. They are responsible for administering the Medicare program in the area where they're contracted. So for instance, I worked for, a Medicare administrative contractor that did all of the, the administration in the Northeast region of the United States. So there are multiple departments. Um, generally, you'll be looking at an audit and reimbursement department for the cost report component of that administration. So. All right, and our last best practice. So this, this goes back to all three of the other best practices, right? It, it's an all, in, it's a very wide um, encompassing best practice here. What I really wanna communicate with this is that cost report reviews. So we've reviewed our mappings, we've reviewed our cost allocation methodologies. We're reviewing our settlement periodically throughout the year. Now this really speaks to the need for multiple layers of review. So we're required to file these cost reports at least annually. Um, generally it's five months after your fiscal year end. And you are attesting to, so you have to sign these cost reports when you submit them to your Medicare administrative contractor. And when you sign off on this report, you're, you're essentially telling them, we, we believe all this information is accurate and we, we will attest to that accuracy. Um, there's a big signature page and nowadays you can do it electronically. Um, back when I first started at the, the local Medicare administrative contractor, you had to get a what's called a wet signature and you know they had these methods I, I still remember it to this day um having to you know uh, lick my finger and then wipe it across a, a wet signature to make sure that it was a legitimate wet signature because they wouldn't accept even a scanned copy of the signature so just an interesting um interesting tidbit there from my mac days but now you can do it electronically but 
e either way, what you are doing is you are attesting to the accuracy of your cost report. Um, the reality is that the cost report is extremely complex. Um, there are hundreds of calculations, at least. I, I didn't go in and tick and tie each one of the calculations, but there might even be thousands in there. It's, it's difficult to say, but, and there are multiple ties to regulatory references. So where does this leave us? There is a, there is a large band or margin of error that, that could exist in a cost report. Now they make certain preparation softwares and, some, and I know a lot of our critical access hospitals um, work with a local accounting firm or, or even in some cases a national accounting firm to prepare their cost reports and file them. So when you, when you utilize these tools, it certainly mitigates the risk of errors within the cost report. That being said, um, there are still so many areas in which you can go astray on the cost report that really having a multi-tiered review process prior to filing the cost report is, is our best practice here. You can't have just one person kind of sitting in a room and they go in there for four months and they spend all their days working on it and then submit it directly to the, the uh, Medicare administrative contractor. That would not, you know, the best practice is to have a multi-tiered review system where you're having at least one other person preferably more than that, review the cost report, who is different from the person who actually prepared the cost report. And the reason being, you know, when you're in the weeds, you're in the weeds, right? And it really takes a, a second look from somebody outside of, of that being in the weeds to be able to catch some of the things that you might have missed. All right, looks like there's Q&A, but that's about the, the link for the webinar, okay. And uh, just, I like to show this page. This is the worksheet S for the settlement page on the Medicare cost report. So um, what I highlighted here was the statement where they say that it, it is estimated that about 674 hours are needed for preparation of a Medicare cost report. Now, whether or not this is exactly true for it, it's debatable and, and it's kind of, how do you measure that? You know, what are we including in that? Is it the time to enter in the data into the cost report, or is it all of the pre-work that goes into it, the data polling to make sure that our numbers are, are accurate. Um, the point being, there, they estimate there being a significant amount of time that goes into these Medicare cost reports, and I can certainly attest to the preparation process being incredibly time-consuming and very, um, it, it's, again, an area where if you don't have the proper systems in place, it can be an area where there are high high degrees of potential for errors of some kind. So now that we've covered the best practices, we're going to jump into some of the common reimbursement opportunities that we see here at Stroudwater. We've had the privilege to be able to work with a number of hospitals throughout the country to review their cost reports and look for areas of opportunity. And what you find over time is that there are certain trends, there are certain areas where um, we see the same opportunity crop up. Um, so we, we're looking at five today. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to look at a significant volume of these opportunities in great detail. Um, that being said, if you have a desire to hear more about all the different reimbursement opportunities that we see here, I'd be happy to talk with you for you know hours about the Medicare cost report. Not that many people want to do that, but if you are interested, I am certainly game to, to have those discussions. And again, here are the five that we've identified and we'll be talking about in this presentation. First one, Medicare bad debts. This is a topic that has um, been a challenge ever since I began you know, working at the Medicare administrative contractor and throughout my you know, cost report preparation days and even up till now um, in reviewing cost reports for a number of critical access hospitals. Um, this is a huge challenge, the Medicare bad debt. So the general principle is when you have deductibles and coinsurance for our traditional Medicare patients um, that remain unpaid, these are included on your Medicare cost report as allowable, allowable costs. So Medicare has essentially said that 
if a Medicare patient doesn't cover the deductible and co-insurance amount for the certain service provided at the hospital, um, then they're going to pick up the tab to a degree. Um, they're not going to cover the entire amount, and um, it's becoming less and less the amount that Medicare will cover as a program. But the option is, is there. Um, in order to claim these Medicare bad debts, first of all, you have to be tracking them. So you have to be able to understand the patient responsibility amounts from our Medicare uh, patients. And not only that, you need to be able to tell a lot of information about how that bad debt was pursued. Um, so all the collection efforts that went into it, you know, how many times did we, did we bill a patient? Do we have a bad debt collection policy that we adhere to? Um, do we... Do we send our bad debts to a collection agency? Um, if so, when are they being returned? There's a significant um, so there's a significant amount of work that goes into filing these Medicare bad debts. But if you are able to file them and provide all the information, then you get reimbursed 65 percent of your allowable total. So what happens is, and I believe we have a slide coming up here where we show um, where this is calculated, but you'll calculate your total. Medicare bad debts for a given fiscal period. Um, and then Medicare will multiply that allowable amount by 65%. Um, and that is your reimbursement for allowable bad debts. Now, the opportunity that we see at Stroudwater are, and there's actually multiple opportunities. One of the big ones is that hospitals often are not tracking Medicare bad debts in a way that allows them to claim them on their Medicare cost report. And frequently, the hospitals that we work with aren't providing the adequate documentation that withstands what's called the test of audit. So when you provide Medicare bad debts on your cost report, um, it, it's, you know, it's not a guarantee, but it's highly likely that the Medicare administrative contractor, um, you know, once the cost report has been filed and, and once they've gotten into their review period, that they're going to look at your Medicare bad debts and they're going to determine whether or not they are allowable. So they're going to look at actual documentation that substantiates your ability to claim those on the Medicare cost report. It's a very in-depth process and we don't have the time to discuss it today. Although, again, if you are interested, feel free to reach out to me because I would love to talk to you more about this, but that's, that's a huge area. So we often find that hospitals don't maintain the adequate documentation to withstand the test of audit. And then we also find that, you know, hospitals can run into trouble with preparing bad debt listings that are in the proper format to be claimed. Um, so generally we look for a critical access hospital to have somewhere around, you know, 10% of overall Medicare deductible and co-insurance amounts being claimed as Medicare bad debt. We look at this when we're reviewing Medicare cost reports and we often find that um, hospitals are under that, that threshold. Now it does depend, there are some, there are lots of nuances in Medicare bad debts, but that's kind of what we use as a barometer to figure out what's going So what we're seeing here on the screen now is your, your the inpatient section of the Medicare cost report, just to illustrate, you know, the bad debt. Um, so on line 25 there, you have your total allowable bad debts. Uh, again, we exclude professional services. So these are, are really just that, that hospital, you know, technical component. Um, but then we have that adjusted reimbursable bad debts on line 26, which is that percentage. And then when you're claiming bad debts, another layer of nuances, you have to claim what's called dual eligible beneficiary bad debts. So those are for you know, Medicare and Medicaid programs. If you have that situation, you need to report those. Um, and again, just going into it a little bit more, this is your outpatient side, your emergency e part B where our, we have, again, our total allowable bad debts, the adjusted amount based on the 65%, and then the total for dual eligible beneficiaries. So the solution, and it's not so much a, a solution in that it's a you know best practice, what we need to do is ensure that our bad debts are properly tracked and that we've closed all collection efforts. A huge area where hospitals get, get stuck is that they claim a Medicare bad debt as allowable on the cost report to be reimbursed, but they haven't actually pulled that back from a collection agency. Many hospitals nowadays are using collection agencies to pursue bad debts. Um, so th this is a big area of opportunity. Um, 
the solution, you know, prepare bad debt listings in the prescribed CMS format. There's been some recent changes to this that require a lot more information uh, for you to, to claim Medicare bad debts. Again, we don't have the time to, de to delve into those details today, but if you're, if you're interested in learning more about that, we can certainly talk about it um, offline. And then really just ensuring that proper documentation is maintained. So our, our MACs will frequently audit Medicare bad debts. And it's really important that we ensure if we're putting something on the Medicare cost report and you know we're taking the time to put together the Medicare bad debt listing and all that, that we really have the documentation to support it because it's very likely that those are going to be audited. Overhead cost allocation. So this was going back to our you know best practices. We got to make sure that we're reviewing these. Um, we want to touch on this as an area of opportunity because it, it's it's such a big area of opportunity that we find um, with critical access hospitals. Again, as I mentioned before, what we want these overhead cost allocations to do is to, as best as we can, accurately reflect the overhead usage by department um, of that overhead cost center. Uh, so we're required to allocate these overhead costs to the non-overhead cost centers. Um, so we have a, a you know a federal regulation reference here where it's just saying that you know cost data the the reimbursable cost data needs to be based on an approved method of cost finding. So this gets back to my earlier comment around how CMS has prescribed excuse me prescribed certain methodologies uh, to be utilized in our cost allocations, but there is opportunity for us to work with our local Medicare administrative contractors in some ways to adjust these depending upon our needs. Um, so the opportunity, there's a lot of prescribed methods of cost finding, um, but they, they're not always the best methodology. Um, there's gen or there can often be no direct correlation with actual overhead usage and the prescribed methodology, uh, which poses a risk in a number of different ways. Um, generally, the biggest risk we, we see when we're thinking about cost-based reimbursement, right? So we want our cost reports to have as much as makes sense, um, allowable cost on our Medicare cost reports. And when we have allocation methodologies that are not truly reflective of overhead costs, we see this very often where there will be a substantial amount of overhead costs allocated to non-reimbursable cost centers, which takes them out of our cost-based reimbursement. So if we are allocating a significant amount of this overhead cost to our non-reimbursable cost centers, that results in us reducing the amount of reimbursement that we would get through the Medicare cost report. Um, so there's the inappropriate allocation methodologies. That's a big issue. Some other issues that we see, double counting. So if we are directly allocating certain expenses to a department on the cost report, and then we also have an overhead allocation that contains a similar expense that we're then allocating to that cost center. Basically, we're not taking into consideration the direct costing that we're doing. Then this can at times hurt us. This will result in, in an inaccurate um, cost allocation. And then there's exclusions. So if we have you know a building where we have some square footage that for whatever reason we missed on the cost report filing, and now we have cost allocation methodologies that are that are not aligned. Um, so it goes back to our matching principle, right? That compromises the matching principle of matching expenses and revenues. So again, big big challenge there. The solution to this, again, I feel like I've harped on this many times, but we need to be reviewing these methodologies on at least an annual basis to make sure that they make sense. So. This doesn't mean that we look at you know this year's cost report and compare it to last year's and make sure that we're using a consistent methodology. This is taking an objective look at our cost allocation methodologies and saying, does this make sense? Does this does this pass the smell test? Does this is this an accurate representation of what the the cost cost finding should be? You know, we want to make sure that we're not double counting expenses. And then the solution is really working with your um, cost report preparer and local Medicare administrative contractor to, to seek out a methodology change if it's deemed to be favorable. Um, we recommend obviously doing some due diligence before you take this, this path, but um, this would be considered a best practice.
moving on to our next opportunity, related party cost allocations. This is becoming um, more and more prevalent in uh, the critical access hospitals that we're working with because a number of them are being um, brought into larger healthcare systems, which creates a greater imperative for us to be reviewing the related party costs that are being um, moved or you know transferred, however you want to you know put that to the critical access hospital on the Medicare cost report. So the worksheet that we're looking at here is worksheet A-8-1. And what we'll see generally the way it's structured is we'll have a critical access hospital that is a part of a larger system and they will receive certain cost allocations from that home office because they, you know, the, the corporate or the, the healthcare um, the healthcare system is providing a number of administrative functions for the critical access hospital. And so they'll they'll have these transfer over on this A-8-1 schedule. And then it'll be compared to the amount that was paid to the healthcare system, sometimes referred to as a management fee. Um, and so they will compare those two amounts. And if the cost allocated to the critical access hospital is greater than the fees, the amounts actually paid um, to the healthcare system, then you will see a, a, an increase, a positive adjustment to your reimbursement. Um, and the, the alternate is also true, where if you are, um, if the management fee, these internal transactions occurring are greater than the allocated cost on the home office, then you'll see a, a negative adjustment because um, we're, we're basing this on reasonable cost. So again, we have the general principle there. Um, cost allocations are often made through a home office cost statement. Uh, this is generally prepared by the health system. Uh, structure is very common that with critical access hospitals that are a member of a system, which is again becoming more and more common. Um, the opportunity that we see at Stroudwater is that there's often significant variation in the treatment of these related party costs. And so we need to really proactively work with our healthcare systems. If you are part of a system, if you have management agreement with the system, if you are receiving some form of, of service from a healthcare system and we're seeing those, those transactions occur, we need to be working proactively with them to make sure that you know, the cost allocation methodologies are, are accurate, that they're appropriate. Um, oftentimes we'll, we'll work with systems who aren't quite understanding of the cost base reimbursement implications of some of these home office allocations. And so it's really crucial to, to be in there and making sure that, that people understand these implications for our critical access hospitals. And this is just an example of worksheet A-8-1, which shows the difference between what they consider allowable costs. So in this situation, it would be the cost allocated from the home office and then the amount in column five or amount included in worksheet A would represent the, the fees paid for those given services. You know, as you'll look on, you know, lines 4.01 through 4.05, oftentimes they'll be, they'll be the same. So you'll have, you know, a, a cost charge at the end of the year. And it, there's all different methods by which healthcare systems will, will make these allocations, but um, it's really important to review these. All right, we've got two more in here. I'll try and close up quickly. So we have physician standby time. So the general principle, again, when physicians are compensated um, on a salary basis or hourly basis, they, they can include a reasonable, reasonable amount in allowable cost for ED of physician availability services. There are some requirements associated with this, um, but we, we're looking at the time. And the reason why it's important in the emergency department is because there often in the rural settings in our critical access hospitals, there are significant periods of time. You know, we don't have a consistent uh, stream of, of patients in the ED all the time necessarily. And so what happens is on the Medicare cost report on your worksheet A-8-2, you are required to report what would be considered a provider component, which is the time um, that, you can kind of think of it as administrative time, but it's it's time outside of seeing patients in the emergency department. And then you have the professional component where a physician is, is seeing the patient. And so what we often find or the opportunity that we see is that critical access hospitals will not accurately report um, the time spent. 
seeing patients. And there have been a number of different uh, solutions that have been proposed um, by different different entities to address this because it's been realized that this is a really important reimbursement opportunity for our hospitals. Um, the solution is really to, to think about some Medicare administrative contractor approved methodology for, for analyzing that um, physician standby on call time. Um, we generally see time studies or another time tracking mechanism being best practice. That, that being said, you know it's important to work with your local MAC to figure out what is approved. And again, this is just a, a quick review, again, worksheet A-2 showing, you know, we have our total remuneration, the total cost for our emergency room physicians, uh, professional component representing the cost associated with seeing the time with patients, and then the provider component, which would be that non-patient provider time. And again, the more that that column five provider component is, the greater that is, the more, um, our allowable costs will be on the Medicare cost report. And so it's just really important to make sure we're tracking this accurately. And then finally, we have um, our provider-based rural health clinic. Uh, really tracking this, this is again, a very common thing for critical access hospitals. Um, so what, what happens is that, you know, provider-based RHCs are paid at the all inclusive rate for, for qualified services. And so the Medicare cost report essentially determines a productivity factor for all of our providers. This is on our uh, worksheet M-2, if you have a provider-based RHC. What we often find is that um, providers are not accurately tracking, one, the, the total visit count, but also the provider FTE count in there. And so what happens is if we are not as productive as a Medicare cost report, um, wants us to be what ends up happening is they use a certain minimum number of visits to calculate our total cost per visit, which then gets applied to our Medicare uh, visits or Medicare patients. And so if we aren't tracking our FTEs and our um, visits correctly to exclude things that shouldn't be included in, a, in our provider-based RHC, then we're really running the risk of, of harming our reimbursement in that way. And I know this has been a little bit um, different in the recent past is, you know, we've gotten waivers in, in a lot of cases. We see a lot of hospitals who have received waivers during the public health emergency. Um, and now as we start to come out of that, it's going to become that much more important um, that we are tracking this accurately. And again, this is just a quick example of our worksheet M-2 where it shows kind of what, what happens when we have, um, in this case, they, their total visits exceeded a uh, minimum visit total in column four. So our actual visits are in column two, minimum are in column four. If the amount in column two were to be less than the amount in column four, our minimum visits, the cost report would take our minimum visits and use that to calculate our all-inclusive rate, which would be, which would harm our reimbursement because that would end up being a lower rate per visit. So the opportunity, we just really need to be reviewing this. Again, this is a common theme. We have to be reviewing this consistently um, to make sure that we're properly excluding non-RHC services in that calculation. And with that, I am all done. I, I will open it up for, in case there are any questions or, or comments. Um, I'm not seeing any in the chat at this moment. Um, All right, so I'm seeing a question come through. Is there anything that we should be focusing on first from a cost report perspective? Um, I think, you know, focusing on the initial four best practices that were spoken of um, at the very beginning of the presentation is really important. Um, it, it is, uh, they are really important to, to implement and some of them are not incredibly difficult to implement, there might be some additional time associated with that. But um, I've found that, you know, even something as simple as incorporating another level of review into your cost report preparations, that is something that wouldn't, uh, how do I say this? Uh, time is valuable and, and we're doing a lot, uh, you know, people are busier than ever, but I think taking even a short period of time to have somebody review the cost report who was outside of the process and, and understands 
some of the mechanics behind you know, cost-based reimbursement is really important for our critical access hospitals. So that would be something that I would, I would kind of focus on quickly. And then considering just doing a, a cost report review. So having somebody uh, external or objective who can look at your last filed cost report and say, okay, you know, this is what we're seeing and here are some opportunities that we think might be there and having that conversation that can potentially, um, that, that, can, that can result in significant positive benefit from our perspective. Um, and again, this is from reviewing, you know, uh, I don't even know how many cost reports at this point, but having that kind of objective uh, review process is very helpful. So I am I'm not seeing any more questions in the the Q and A here. Um, I'll just give it one more minute in case something comes up. Um, but at this point, unless there's anything else, I will be turning it over. I will be turning it over to our next uh, presenter. And Wade, that is me. Can you hear me that okay this morning? Yes, yes. Ah. So Amy, uh, I, I will I'll, I'll let you, uh, I could say a lot, but I'll just say that Amy is an amazing uh, revenue cycle resource and uh, she has been a great help for me. And we work together very frequently on some of the, the touch points between cost reporting and the revenue cycle. And so it's really been a uh, privilege to work with her and I'm excited to, to hear about pricing transparency. So I'll kick it off to you, Amy. Hey, thanks, Wade. I appreciate it. And going to quickly turn on my video and say, good morning, everybody. Um, I am so excited you are here. Really looking forward to <laughs> talking to you about price transparency. Now, doesn't that sound like an exciting topic to talk about today? Uh, but I really am because it, it's it's really impactful and and as we go through the presentation what i'll do is um share the um i'll share my screen and some of the things the learnings that we had with pricing transparency and what's been going on so my learning objectives for this are really to start off first and say what is pricing transparency? You may have heard it talked about out there. You see Becker's reports that come out talking about it, different articles in HFMA and in um, no, with NRHA and all of the different organizations out there talking about price transparency. And then what we're going to do is talk about tales from a small hospital. And I, I, we've got some friends in North Carolina that we're going to talk about their experiences, how to address the violation, and then just give you some key learnings to take with you related to this pricing transparency situation and compliance and how to comply with it. So we're going to start off by saying, what is price transparency? Well, believe it or not, price transparency has been going on for a while now. Um, it, in November of 2019, so before the pandemic hit, um, CMS finalized the calendar year 2020 hospital outpatient PPS policy changes and payment rates, ambulatory surgical center payment system policy changes and payment rates, pricing transparency requirements for hospitals to make standard charges public. Okay, we're just going to call that pricing transparency. But you know now that it's related to a legislative act that came. Um, there is the act. If you want to go and read it, it's fun. If you are having some sleepless nights, you, you can read it and it will help you go to sleep. It was effective on January 1st, 2021. So we, even with all of the activities that occurred related to the pandemic, it still went into place on January 1st. It's required from all licensed hospitals within the United States. So all hospitals, if you are a hospital, no matter if you're a critical access hospital, a PPS hospital or behavioral health hospital or a children's hospital, this information is required to be posted out there. And what it is doing is it's providing accessible pricing information in two ways. 
it's a comprehensive machine readable file. We're going to talk about that. And then there's the display of shoppable services that's done in a consumer friendly format. And what they mean by shoppable services, you may have heard price transparency referred to as shoppable services. And what I just wanted to share with you is that shoppable services is a portion of price transparency. It's not all related. It's not all of price transparency. So we'll talk about that as well. And then why do we care? Why am I talking about that this morning, right? Why, why do I get so excited? Why do I try to get y'all engaged in it? It's because you know what? If you fail to comply with this, there will be a civil monetary penalty of $300 per day for hospitals with a bed count of 30 or fewer, and a penalty of $10 per bed per day with ho for hospitals with a bed count of greater than 30. So think about it. $300 per day over time, that's a lot of money that you could receive in fines. So you really want to make sure that your hospital is complying with price transparency. So when looking at price transparency, let's talk about the first piece of it. This is the, honestly, the geeky techie side of things um, that's talking about a, con a comprehensive machine readable file. And this is a file that can be in different formats. Typically, you see it out there in a CSV file. And so, see, I'm really getting into some techie words with CSV and a JSON format and things like that. But what this comprehensive machine readable file does is it includes all standard charges for all items and services for all locations operating under a single hospital license. So think about it, your hospital, how many locations do you have that are operating underneath your hospital single license? And all of those locations, their charge masters must be included in this comprehensive machine readable file. And I know that causes challenges for some people, some locations, because you have disparate systems that you've got this clinic that may be sitting over to the side that bills under your hospital license, but it needs to be included in, its information needs to be included in this comprehensive machine readable file. It needs to be posted on a publicly available website. That means that when they go to your website for your hospital, people can find it. It's easily accessible without barriers, so they can find it, they can get into it, they can look at the information, they being anybody, and that it's digitally searchable so that the information that's out there, it needs to be updated at least once annually, and we'll talk about that here in a minute, once annually, and it follows a standard naming convention which I think is really interesting because they give you a lot of flexibility and a lot of other things, but it has to have this standard naming convention that has been issued by CMS. And then it must contain the following data elements, a description of every item. So think about all your standard charges must have a description, a discounted cash price. That's the charge that applies to an individual who pays cash or cash equivalents for shopping for the services. A payer specific negotiated charge. That is that if you have a negotiated agreement with a third party payer for the service, that information must be listed. It, then you also need to include DI identified minimum negotiated charge and a DI identified maximum negotiated charge, meaning that you have to say on this file, what's the highest amount that you will be paid for it? And what's the lowest amount that you'll be paid for these services? I find it really interesting that you have to de-identify this maximum and minimum when you have to pay your specific produce the information. But you know what? I didn't make the rules. I just follow them. So I wanted to share with you that you have to give the information about hey, this is how much this specific payer is going to reimburse us for all items and services for all locations operating under a single license. So that's the comprehensive machine readable file, right? 
Y'all can get your charge master, you load it in, boop, there's your information. Okay, it takes a little more work than that. I know, but that's in theory what we're doing. Then there is a second component to price transparency. That second component is a shoppable services file. And this shoppable services file, in it, there are a few more requirements on it. That there are 70 CMS specified shoppable services that are provided by hospitals that must be included. Now, those are things, and it's really interesting. Those are things like um, a behavioral health visit, but then there's also a comprehensive metabolic panel, and then there's a colonoscopy, and then there are some OB services. These are items that are required to be included on your shoppable services file, whether you provide them or not. So when thinking about the shoppable services, if you don't provide, say, um, colonoscopy at your facility, then you must also find an additional three, 230 services. So say you provided all 70 of them, you have to have an additional 230 services to go with it. But say you only provide 60 of those CMS services, then you need to find an additional 200 and Oh, do the math, I mean, 240 services out there to complete this shoppable services listing, right? Okay, that's where one of our challenges is. We'll get to that when I'll talk about this case study that we have. It includes ancillary services that are connected with these 300 shoppable services. So one of the items is a CT of your, a CT of your head. That is one of the required shoppable, or CT of your abdomen is one of your required shoppable services. Well, with that CT, do you also have contrast? Do you have the radiologist team? Those are items that have to be included in your shoppable services file. Think about your blood test. You have a comprehensive metabolic panel. You also have to include any ancillary services like the venipuncture, the blood draw that goes along with it. So that's part of this shoppable services file. It needs to be included, you know, again, includes all the locations operating under the single license, posted on a publicly available website. You got to be able to find it. Easily accessible, digitally searchable, updated at least once annually. But they also give you a patient estimator tool. So your hospital may have a patient estimator tool. That is an approved option for meeting the shoppable services requirement. Now, in addition to the shoppable services, it has to contain certain elements as well. Very similar to what was on the comprehensive machine readable file, that it has a description of each item but then it also has ancillary services connected with that identified service on the shoppable service. The indicator of CMS specified services not offered. So like we don't offer the colonoscopy. So therefore we have to reflect on this shoppable services file that you do not offer a colonoscopy. You include the discounted cash price, payer specific negotiated charge, again, the de-identified minimum and the de-identified maximum, meaning highest charge you offer and the lowest charge. Now, why are we doing this? We're providing this information. In theory, what we are doing is to say that people can go and, and price shop for certain services. They know that um, if you're going to have a colonoscopy, you should be able to go to any hospital and figure out how much for your payer that you would have to pay as part of that service. So these are things that would be scheduled in advance. So in thinking about these 300 items, they're items that are scheduled in advance. They're not emergency services. So, you know, you may include your ER level one, but I don't know about you, but if I'm in if I need an emergency room, I'm going to the closest emergency room. I may not drive to go, go to a different one because the prices are different. But just thinking about the information that's being um, contained in this file um, and how you would use it and sharing that with your community. 
Now, let's talk about enforcement. When this first rolled out in 2021, the question I got all the time was, Amy, are you sure that this is going to, you know, are they really going to pay attention to us? Are you sure this is going to stay into effect? What's going on? Well, here's what I can tell you. Yes, price transparency is being enforced. And I can tell you that I know, and I'm going to give you a tale from a small hospital, and I'm going to name this hospital because they gave me permission, but I'm going to name this hospital. But I've got four other friends that this has happened to where they have received this inform this notice of violation. So CMS on April 26th, they're like, you know what? We've got this out there. It's time to get people acting on it. So we're going to strengthen our enforcement process. So they have stricter timelines. They are living fines more frequently. And how that process works is that they give you a notice of violation. So you can get this letter in the mail, a notice of violation from CMS. So you know that makes everybody's heart beat a little quicker. That you have the notice of violation with the 90-day window to remediate. And then you fix that. Then if you don't meet all the requirements, they give you a, you have to submit a corrective action plan to say how you will be in full compliance within 90 days of the date of the letter. How you will have your pricing transparency offering um, in compliance and you have 45 days to support to submit that corrective action plan. And so what's happening though is that hospitals, so, you know, the process is notice the violation, corrective action plan. Well, <laughs> If there are hospitals that they go out and look and determine that, you know what, this hospital is not making any attempt to satisfy the requirement, you know, they haven't posted the machine readable file, they can't find shoppable services or a price estimator tool, CMS is no longer waiting to have you go through the notice of violation and ignore that for 90 days. They're going straight to a corrective action plan where it's a 45-day submission deadline and a 90-day full compliance. And I will tell you, one of my friends, they ended up getting a, they didn't get a notice of violation. It went straight to a corrective action plan. And the reason it went to corrective action plan is because CMS could not find their file. I know, they're out there. I saw them on the website, but CMS could not find them because they weren't named correctly. So just keep that in mind that you may not get a notice of violation. It may go straight, like do not pass go, do not collect $200. We are corrective action plan immediately. And you've got 45 days to get this corrective action plan submitted. So I've talked about all the legalese and everything. And I've given um, behind the scenes curtain that, you know, I, we had a tale from a small hospital. So let's talk about this tale from a small hospital. This was Allegheny Health. They're a 25 bed critical access hospital in Sparta, North Carolina. So I know you're thinking, mm, they're only gonna talk to the big hospitals. They find that hospital down in Georgia. Don't you know about that? I'm like, yes. But let me tell you about my friend at a 25 bed hospital in Sparta, North Carolina. They were using shoppable services, using a free tool. They had a vendor that called me and said, look, I got this free option, you wanna use it? I'm like, sure, we'll use it. But like many other critical access hospitals, they struggled to identify 300 unique shoppable services to include on that listing. And this occurs because they had limited patient volumes that were going through this free tool. They had limited services that they were offering and they just didn't have the volume so that this free tool could pick up the information and create that offering for them. So one day, back in November, they received a hospital price transparency warning notice from CMS stating that the hospital was non-compliant with the requirements. So one of the good things, if there is a good thing about these violation notices, I know I gotta look on the bright side about something. Good thing about these violation notices is that it will tell you specifically what happened, okay? So, how the violations come about. CMS evaluates hospital compliance using several different methods. They'll either audit your hospital's website, they'll evaluate any complaints that, that, that have been made to CMS, 
You know, it's like phone a friend, you phone CMS and rat on your neighbor because they're not doing it. Okay. Oh, don't say that out loud. I didn't mean recorded. Oops. Anyway, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Evaluating complaints made this CMS. And then they're reviewing in, you know, individuals or entities analysis of non-compliance. So there could be a company that's going out there looking for this information and they see that your hospital was not complying and they can tell CMS and CMS will determine whether or not you re need to receive a violation notice. So anyway, Allegheny, let's get back to my friends. They received a notice on a Tuesday in November stating that the review of the hospital's website had occurred on the previous Wednesday, the week before, right before Thanksgiving, that they, a review had been done the previous Wednesday. And then they provided that the specific violations were provided. There was a violation for not posting a comprehensive machine readable file. And there were violations related to the display of the shoppable services. Specifically, no consumer friendly list of standard charges was found. And then they were told you have 90 days to fix it. And it, and you know, so it's like, oh, you know, and I, I don't know about you, but if I get a CMS violation notice, I am immediately concerned, right? And the questions that are running through my head and the questions that ran through their head were, who could help us remediate the, the issue? 90 calendar days might not be enough time to complete the project. How much is this remediation going to cost? And $300 a day fine is a substantial amount of money to pay for critical access hospital, right? So when thinking about this, these are the things that when you're talking, the C, you know, your CEO gets this letter and it's like, okay, my name is on here. It has notice of violation. And I know that there are fines associated with it. Who can help me out? How much time do I have? Is that enough time? What's it going to cost me? You know, and, you know, and is that cost going to offset this $300 day fine that I may get if I don't meet compliance? So. That we thankfully, Allegheny and I had a we we're having a phone call on the very next morning at the the morning after they got this, we were meeting on another topic, and they're like, Amy, we need five minutes of your time. Can you help me out? And so what we did is we just their first step, they reached out to a partner who was familiar with their facility and pricing transparency. But thankfully, we were on the call to say, hey, you know, we're talking about another subject, but do you know anybody who can help us out? We're like, or your friend, be more than happy to work with you. And then what we did is we connected with the Office of Rural Health, because when thinking about what's the cost of this remediation going to be, don't forget you've got resources within your offices of rural health who can perhaps assist you with these, these efforts in in um, helping to alleviate some of the costs related to those remediation issues. It might fall under one of the uh, one of the federal programs that's out there. So we connected with the Office of Rural Health and them and and they partnered with them on this project. They immediately formed an internal task team uh, task force to support the project. So it was the you know what, we got to have people all hands on deck, who can be, you know, this is our highest priority because of it. And then what they had to acknowledge, though, is that this free one size fits all, one size fits most model, they were part of the, yeah, it didn't fit our services. And so we started working together on creating a compliant offer. And so you know, they get this letter, they've already started calculating out 90 days from now, when is that? What do we have? We were using this before, it did not meet our need. Let's create something that would meet the need. And so then we worked together to create the offering. So we created a shoppable services offering and the comprehensive machine readable file. We worked with identifying 300 total services that could be used for inclusion on the list, incorporating in our clinic charge masters, the services that are being provided, certain services that they wanted to highlight within their, within their community of services that they have the highest quality. People should come and visit them. 
So in looking at that, then we had to go and find payer contracts. Now, I don't know about you, but when's the last time you went looking for your payer contract so that you could find that the payer specific negotiated charges that needed to be listed? And we were able to develop an Excel model, simple Excel model that fit the needs of the Allegheny system or the Allegheny hospital and posted it on the Allegheny website. And so in in looking at that and doing it, making sure that we could meet their needs. Now, there's also, we put together the comprehensive machine readable file, which included services that were listed on the hospital and the clinic charge master, right? It did not need to associate any ancillary charges if they were listed separately within that charge master itself. We had those payer negotiated rates that were captured as part of the shoppable services file. We included that and you can go and see there is a CSV file that's posted on the Allegheny website. And you know what? We were so excited. We got all of these, all of these files completed within 60 days of receiving that initial notification. So, the, you know, it's like, okay, what do we do now? And I remember it's like, we're going to reach out to CMS. And we found out, you know what? You don't reach out to CMS. You actually have to wait for the stealth ninja to return. You know, that person that bought that, uh, we, I honestly don't know how they do it. If it's a person or if it is, um, if it's a person or, uh, or a bot that's looking at it, but we had to wait for the, I call them just the stealth ninja. The, the thing that's going out there and looking at our website to see, looking at Allegheny's website to see if they were in compliance or not. You know, you tried sending them emails and nope, they stealth ninja. So then on March, 2023, we received a notice of violation and a request for a corrective action plan. Now, you know how a minute ago I was talking to you about, we got all this flexibility and things like that, but they wanted it named in a standard naming convention. Well, CMS, Stealth Ninja, went out and reviewed the hospital's website, and they found two violations. <laughs> One violation was it, the comprehensive machine-readable files did not include any room and board charges. We got those added. And it also said that it had a failure to follow the naming convention specified by CMS, which is your EIN underscore hospital name underscored standard charges dot and the file format. There were no violations identified on the shoppable services file, but the Allegheny was given 45 calendar days to provide a to uh, provide it to complete and submit the corrective action plan so that we would say, we named it, here's the reason of our violation, here's our corrective action plan, we're gonna save it with the right name. When was that done? That very day, you know, in the room and board charges, those lines had accidentally been deleted from the file that was posted. So those were included as well. And so Allegheny was able to make the required updates, submit the corrective action plan, signed off by the administrator and submitted it to their um, to CMS within th three calendar days. And then what happened? We waited for the Stealth Ninja to return <laughs> because again, this is all happening in the background. There's not a lot of communication between us and CMS. They're not going to reach out and phone a friend and be like, hey, glad to talk to you. The Stealth Ninja returned within 30 days. And they issued a compliance notice and we all celebrated. We were so excited by that compliance notice. But it helped us realize that you have to pay attention that within all the flexibility that is out there with those shoppable services file and the comprehensive machine readable file, that there are still certain requirements that must be followed. So our key learnings around that, the one key learning was that this shoppable services, the pricing transparency legislation was not meant just for the large institution. The rural and critical access facilities are not exempt. They must follow these rules. The um, 
comprehensive machine readable files and the shoppable services files, they contain similar yet unique information. The information between the two of those, very similar with one another, but it is indeed unique. And CMS does provide flexibility in the formatting of the file, but standard criteria must be met. Remember, incorrect file naming convention and omission of last review date will cause a violation. Um, one of my friends that I have out there, you know, they had all this information posted, but when you went and looked at their shoppable services offering, it said last review date, January 23, 2022, and they received a notice of violation in March because it had not been updated at least annually. And the last key learning is resources are available to provide support. You don't have to solve this alone. So if, you know, don't think that your Lone Ranger, you know, I've got no one who can provide me support, you know, phone a friend. I'm more than happy, as you can tell after this past time, more than happy to talk to you about price transparency because I find it very interesting how that, you know, how that they are providing this information. And I know a lot of you are thinking, but nobody in my community is going to look at that. And my answer to you is, today. Nobody in your community may be looking at it today. However, tomorrow, someone in your community may want to know, do you provide a colonoscopy? And if so, what is the cost going to be for me? So that gets to the end. I am now up to my Q&A. And I, the first question that I see out there on the chat, or the first question in Q&A that comes up, is going to be, hey, Amy, do you have a list of those 70 shoppable services? And my answer is, yes, I do, Sure, Ann. Um, it's in the appendix. I've listed out all 70 of the CMS specified shoppable services so that um, you can see what's out there, what's required to be listed. And then you can determine, you know, if you don't provide 20 of these tests, you're going to need to find 20 additional tests to include in your shoppable services offering. And I'll wait for a minute and see if um, there are any other questions. I'm gonna flip through the pages while I wait. I've got a question coming through. So the question that came through is, have I been seeing anyone begin analyzing the price transparency files? And I do know that the answer is yes. There have been organizations that are going out there and pulling the comprehensive machine readable file to create databases that patients can then tap into. Um, my expectation is one of these days we will... Um, one of these days we will see, you know, apps out there that people can just pull up an app on their phone and find out where's the cheapest place to get a colonoscopy. Like anybody wants to have it. You know what I'm saying? But it's like, you've got to have it done. Okay, I need to stop on that because that could turn real bad real fast. But anyway, going back to, yes, I have seen people um, analyzing these files, and I foresee that in the near future, we will see some apps being developed related to it. I do know there are databases and websites where you can go pull some of that information um, and looking at it. Another question I received is, um, what if I get someone at CMS to tell me that my website is okay after I've received this violation notice? Um, do you think I'm okay then? And my my answer to you is until you you will get a letter back from CMS to, that says that you are in compliance. We've gone back and re-reviewed your website based on the information we pulled on XYZ date. You are in compliance. And so even though you get that verbal okay, until you get that letter back from CMS, I would still make sure that you are dotting your I's and crossing your T's and making the information. Oh, someone just sent a note and asked if um, 
Is it really true that CMS is going behind the scenes to look at our information? Yeah, it is. Stealth ninjas, that's how they're doing it. <laughs> they, if you go and look at the um, information out there related to the legislation itself, it actually tells you this is what CMS is doing, that they are reviewing websites and they are looking at it based on complaints that they've received or any information related to that. I think I might have another question coming in. Well, I, um, I'm Amy Graham. Again, I do love talking about all things revenue cycle, finance, so ways that we can do pricing transparency, the No Surprises Act, all those kind of things. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, we will be sharing this deck with you so that you get that list of 70 specified items that are there related to the shoppable services. And then just from those of us who have been in this presentation, we just wanna say thank you. Um, thank you for attending today's conference. We've got another one, two hours tomorrow, real short and sweet, covering some additional topics. Um, and uh, one of those is, oh, I should, I should, you know, I'll pump my own session. I got one tomorrow morning where we're just gonna talk about some training that we did uh, with one of our organizations. So. Um, we are committed to providing a high quality learning for you, so you will receive a uh, post cert, post event survey that's going to pop up when you exit, and we do appreciate you taking the time to answer that. So thank you very much. You know what? We are five minutes ahead of schedule, and I just feel like gifting you that five minutes today so that you can have a break before your next meeting starts. Thanks. Have a great day, everybody, and we'll talk to you again tomorrow.